All right, this is a walkthrough of the fur trade. I'm going to try to be as loud as I can be, but you can probably tell the voice isn't quite right. This is a picture of an old Minnesotan fur trade establishment. Everything that you see there are pelts of furs. There are two primarily different animals inside, two different pelts. Uh, over up behind her man here, we've got a series of what could be fox with the tail right there. And in front, these are actually beaver, even though these are not beaver skulls. You can see on the right side there that this is a beaver pelt as it is in a circle and stretched out to dry. Everything that I have on the slides, it would be beneficial for you to have on your paper. This is a lot of writing, I understand that, but it is also going to be something that we can do nice and easily. The fur trade itself started when Europeans came to America and Canada. They're pretty indistinguishable right now. This is back when Minnesota was more French than British, and both nations were looking for something that they did not have. At any point during the video, if I'm going to go too quick, the benefit of the video is you're able just to go ahead and stop it and pause it, and you can uh, halt the video to make sure that you get your writing down. Some slides I'm going to have a lot to say, and other slides will go rather quick. We don't know the first fur trade, but most historians and anthropologists, people who study human history, agree that it was probably a knife or a pot, and it was traded for a beaver pelt. Trades took place because money just wasn't valued. If I'm trying to get you to do something and you're super duper rich, you're not going to do it if I offer you $10. You're not going to do it if I offer you $100 because money doesn't have a value. And when the Europeans first arrived into North America, there wasn't a point for them to offer money. Money had no identifiable value amongst the First Nations tribes. There wasn't banks all set up throughout northern Minnesota. The closest bank at this time would have been near Milwaukee. It's going to do you nothing if I offer money. So instead, in order for people to be motivated to do something, they had to be offered something that wasn't money. And so they were offered goods. And these were goods that weren't able to be produced by the Native American tribes. Often this was done by smelting. Smelting is heating up iron and copper, both metals that were prevalent within the Canadian Shield and here in Minnesota. However, the technology and the ability and the knowledge to combine that to create steel, that wasn't um, prevalent within the North American First Nations cultures. And so when the Europeans came over, they offered metal items which were not able to be created here within the borders of Minnesota. That changes later on, and people end up uh, doing a lot of smelting, especially along the Mackenzie River, way up north in Canada. Uh, a few years will go by, we're talking 50 to 60 years, and, and we're also talking uh, the fur trade. We can begin that in the mid 18th century and continue it along. Uh, but smelting is not really going to take over. It's going to be easier to trade something for the items that you'd want. The fur trade worked because both nations wanted something. And the First Nations had furs. They wanted pots and knives and metal items. And the Europeans, they had the metal items. They wanted the furs. Why would they want furs? For these. These glorious beaver hats. These are super popular. Think about this being the modern equivalent of a hydro flask or a new iPhone or a new Android phone. This is the hip item. This is what everybody would want. It shows status. They're not cheap. And so if you had one of these, it was a pleasant way to kind of show off how rich and wealthy you were by walking around the streets wearing a, a beaver hat like this. They're very water repellent as well. And, and each beaver hat is, uh, is, a, is a mix here between two different pelts. If you had a beaver hat though, and you were walking around downtown London, 
or central France, you were definitely showing off just how wealthy you were. And the Europeans had killed most of the European beavers years prior because these hats were so popular. Whoops. The First Nations, what were they doing during this time? Well, the First Nations were trapping the animals for their fur. When I return, we'll talk about uh, what that trapping process looked like, and we'll, we'll go through that. But the First Nations were collecting the furs, and they traded with the Europeans for the goods. They hunted the food, and they traded. Some tribes built homes around the forts. Others were more transient, and they would establish different trading camps, and they would move seasonally along with the beaver. Uh, the Native Americans were trapping beaver fall, summer, winter, and the Europeans were trapping primarily in fall. They were learning a little bit more with the Native Americans, <clears throat> excuse me, as time went on. The Courier de Bois, this means runners of the woods in French. These are uh, Europeans who live a primarily native life. They're going to live with First Nations often. They are going to create and start families with First Nations individuals. They're very much independent and they very much have no permission to be there. These are the precursor to the, the voyagers. Uh, but these are going to just be kind of a 18 to 24 year old men in, in New France or Paris uh, that don't feel like they fit in with what city life will be like. So when they come over to start a new life, uh, often through Montreal and Quebec, they're going to come down through the St. Lawrence Seaway, establish their own uh, families in areas which will become modern day Ontario, Manitoba, Minnesota, Wisconsin. And they're going to start trading and trapping with the Native Americans. It's key to keep in mind they've got no permission to be here. Uh, Minnesota, you weren't allowed to settle officially. And so to have somebody like a courier de bois on the land, they were doing so without permission from either the French or the modern U.S. government. Women in the fur trade played an important role as well, and the First Nations women were unrecognized but incredibly crucial to the fur trade process. Women often were the individuals who cleaned and they guided, they interpreted for the Europeans. They would do so either independently or with a courier de bois, which could have been, uh, in some cases, the husbands. Women were responsible for everything else that was happening. The fur trade is pretty darn extensive and exhaustive. It takes a lot to go through and capture a beaver and to find where the beaver lodges would be, especially in the winter time. In the winter time, you take, uh, you can imagine this process as finding a frozen lake, looking for a bulge over the lake, and then you would take a spear and you try to and a pin cushion the bulge and hope that you get a beaver. This would take hours. Then you have to get out the beaver from the frozen lodge. As this is going on, of course, in winter, there's less sunlight. And it took somebody else to provide for all of the other sustenance, such as the cooking, uh, the providing of a camp, working through all of the materials that were not part of the fur trade. And this was often the role of the women's. Marriages were used to hold the two worlds together. These were marriages not of love. These are marriages of economics, marriages of alliances, a word that we looked at last week. Marriages not of affection, but of tying two groups of people together to make sure that both would mutually benefit. If two tribes were... Uh, causing issues with themselves or with Europeans, a marriage would be an easy way to kind of stop that because then everyone is connected. And marriages were arranged during this time. Not all of them, but many certainly within the uh, European and the native cultures were 
more out of economic convenience than out of love. Here we have a map of Minnesota, and you'll see that uh, these are also our fur trade posts. If you look, you'll be able to identify a theme. I'm going to um, have a quick drink of this and see if you can't find out what the theme is for these fur trade posts. All right. My, uh, my throat's just killing me, so having something to coat here is quite helpful. Uh, if you look at the fur trade posts, they're all on water. And this makes sense because it's way easier to carry something over water than it is to carry it over land. If you're able to put a fur post on water and then you can load up a canoe, which was the historical version of a semi or a freight car on a train, and that beats having to carry it personally. You'll also notice that there's quite a lot towards the north. Snake River Fur Post, this is a good one if you ever drive up towards Duluth. Uh, you and your family can stop at Snake River. This is a Minnesota State Park um, in, in a fur post. You'll also see the Traverse de Sioux just uh, down the street from us. There was one there too. We have four pages of maps here. Not much that we have to worry about writing now. But you'll see that the furs and pelts follow this green line. They, the furs go over to Europe. After that, with the trade, those metal items come back to North America. And those metal items are going to be the ones that are traded in. The furs also went even further, and they go out of Europe around to Asia at which point spices from Asia would make it back to Europe. Sometimes silks and dyes as well, but primarily spices. Here's the entire fur trade. You can see it's a worldwide trade, not just one from Minnesota to Europe. This is a trade that expands the entirety of the world, tying everybody together. I've seen one estimate that says one in five people were directly uh, employed by the fur trade at the height of when the fur trade was, um, was going on. One in five people in the world. What do you think the, the most powerful company today would be? Maybe give you a moment to think about that, but I, I think it might be like... Facebook or Google, Amazon. At the time, the Hudson Bay Company is king. This is the most powerful company in all the world. It controlled most of the fur trade in North America. The Jim, John Jacob Astor Fur Trade Company tried to control some, but um, it didn't quite work out and it quickly succumbed to the Hudson Bay Company. This is a very controlling company. It's still around today. You can still purchase items from the Hudson Bay Company. They're known for their very high-end quality product. Uh, it's a pretty wealthy store. You're not going to go in there with just a few bucks. Uh, their products will last a long time, but they got their start during this fur trade, and they were quite controlling. One of their favorite strategies to control somebody was to take the prices and make the prices so high that at the end of the year at a rendezvous when all the fur traders were back together and they were buying new materials for the upcoming year that at the end of the year they would go through and you'd have to buy your supplies for next year but the supplies would cost just enough that you had no choice but to work for them again this is the same Strategy used by sharecroppers in the south at the end of the antebellum era. Long-term impacts of the fur trade. Their establishment of French and European settlements. As we go through with this, uh, we're going to see 
that much of Minnesota becomes developed. Now, Minnesota was a French establishment. It was primary Le, Le Trois du Nord, our state slogan, the Star of the North, that's, a, that's French in, in homage to this time period. But lots of Minnesota became developed during this time period. If you go up, 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 up north, you're going to see some town names that have connections to uh, French cities and in, in, in establishments there. The population boomed in Canada. Lots of people were coming over. This was the spot of the world to be at. If you wanted lots of money, if you were young and able to set out and, and start your own culture, why not come over? Customs change. Uh, the idea of European or white customs within North America became established. Oftentimes, uh, this is kind of a, a tie between um, like European fashion and North American practicality and the ability uh, here to kind of dress for the weather, but also people take a lot of pride in how they dress. And this started amongst the fur trade. Prior to the fur trade, it was almost pure practicality where you would dress for what you were doing. And, and after the fur trade, we start seeing that it's more and more common for the everyman to dress both for the job, but also take uh, time to develop um, kind of a, a more self-pleasing style. Europeans and First Nations, of course, started to fight as uh, you have two different cultural groups sharing one space. You have twice as many people who are able to kind of come to terms and blows. And this is both an issue because you're getting two different cultures and an issue because you're increasing the amount of people. Increasing the amount of people brings up lots of diseases. And these diseases are diseases that the Native Americans are unable to go through and have uh, immunities for and this unfair trade. If I'm trying to trade you my ring and you've never seen a ring before, and I tell you it's worth one beaver pelt or a hundred beaver pelts, if you've never seen the ring before, you don't know what the fair price is. These Native Americans were often cheated and told of a price that was extremely unfair towards them and benefited the European trader. These are the Impacts of the fur trade. That's my fur trade presentation. I know it kind of went a little bit quick there. I appreciate your patience. Uh, I hope to be back in soon. Remember, by writing this down, you're able to use it on your own test, which is quite nice. Anything you create, you're able to use.